Um, welcome to the second session of our series on lessons in leadership in times of crisis. Uh, I, as Marie said, I'm Sarah Mendelson. I'm the head of Heinz College in DC and distinguished service professor of public policy. I am thrilled to be joined by my longtime friend and colleague, Susan Reichley, who is the president and CEO of the International Youth Foundation. Uh, she's here today, though, in part, really to discuss her longtime experience at USAID. 25 years, she ended as the senior foreign service officer uh, in, in the agency. And today we're gonna t go back 10 years. We're gonna go back to the Haiti earthquake um, when Susan was the acting assistant administrator of the bureau that we both spent time in, the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict and Humanitarian Assistance. This is the Crisis Response Bureau, bureau at USAID. And when a crisis hits, it's 24 seven. So Susan, why don't you take us back it's 4.53 p.m. January 12th, 2010. There's been a 7.0 earthquake hitting Haiti. Where were you and what were you doing when this crisis hit? You need to unmute. I was muted. First, um, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, everyone joining today and, and online uh, in the future, and, and Sarah and Carnegie Mellon Hines for hosting hosting me. Um, you know, when I was asked to uh, talk about this, and particularly I know we'll talk about where we are right now with uh, the global pandemic, and I think every crisis brings you back to that moment when you know this is really just um, unprecedented. And that's how I felt at that time when I saw I was the head of the uh, Humanitarian Assistance Bureau at USAID, and I saw come across my ticker tape at the bottom of my computer, a 7.2 earthquake had hit uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And I, having served there, it was the first place I was assigned when I joined USAID almost 20 years earlier, um, a little more. And I knew that just meant utter, utter devastation, um, given the fragility of Haiti over the years and just unbelievably poor statistics of the average life expectancy of being only 49 years of age, only 40% having access to just basic health care, um, you know, less than 30% had access to electricity. It was just uh, knowing that this earthquake had hit really not just the heart of a country, but the lungs, and it was just going to be devastating. Um, and so I jumped off my out of my computer up from my desk and uh, we at the time and uh, had just had a new administrator who had been uh, confirmed Dr. Raj Shah who's the head of the Rockefeller Foundation and I went running down to the front office to let him know what had just happened and, and what we thought would be obviously a pivotal moment for not only Haiti, but also for USAID, because we were the lead uh, humanitarian assistance uh, response agency. He was actually in a meeting preparing for um, an Afghanistan, what we call a deputies committee uh, meeting, and um, kind of a big deal, because you forget at the time, we were obviously really in the thick of it with Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, but what then happened is I passed the note actually to his staffer because he was he was in a preparation meeting uh, is to let them know and then we just began working. Um, we just started working uh, through the night, meaning the Humanitarian Assistance Bureau uh, and working obviously with our USAID mission who was on the ground trying to connect with them, um, you know, hearing from them as they were hovered under their desks um, after shocks were happening, constantly being just connected and what started on that Tuesday evening um, really just spiraled into not just days but weeks and months of, of really crisis crisis response. So Raj immediately pivots when, when he gets the note and everybody hunkers down and are you trying to reach the mission on the ground? I mean are the phone lines open? Everything's down and we're trying desperately to get a hold of uh, people who are on the ground through a lot of different media. 
students. Um, and this didn't just last for the first, you know, generally you can get communications going within the first couple of hours. Um, but one of the stories, uh, I think, coming out of Haiti, we were also trying to connect, obviously, with the leadership within the Haitian sure. government. At the time, President Praval uh, was a very close um, partner of the United States. President Obama obviously had been in office for a year. We were even just trying to track down um, the government leadership, which had been devastating. You're going to see some pictures in a minute of ministries being flattened. And when we got a hold of our team on the ground, we said, please, you know, have your satellite radio and find President Praval because <laughs> President Obama needs to connect with President Praval as soon as possible. And that took several days. Wow. Um, let's go to the slides, actually. Marie, can you put them up? Let's just get a sense for the kind of devastation that was going on. Can you go to slideshow? I think, great. I think there are some pictures here. Yeah, so here's just uh, some pictures initially of, of the ministries, as I mentioned. Um, you know, this wasn't just... A, a, excuse, excuse me, Susan, you want to go back to... Um, I think it's the next slide. I think. Or the next slide. I, but there, there we go. go. So I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of what did it really look like? I mean, this is the Supreme Court. It was completely flattened. And when I talk about the different ministries, um, also the UN, um, it was a multi-story story building. So you would normally think about like the UN and the government being able to respond. But you have to remember that those, um, not only buildings, people were in these buildings. And um, they, the leadership of not only the country, but also the UN was taken out. The next slide shows uh, another picture of another ministry. If we can go to the next slide. Um, here we have the Ministry of Health and Population, um, obviously decimated. Um, the next slide, I think, shows the Ministry of uh, Interior as well. So this is what the government of Haiti um, looked like. This is what Haiti looked like. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, full of rubble after the earthquake because it wasn't just the initial 7.2 earthquake. They had just aftershock after aftershock that went on for some time. So these are the government agencies on the ground that would have been responding and obviously right. they're incapacitated. Absolutely. And, and that's what I think made the Haiti earthquake um, unique, uh, not only that it was just a two hour flight from the United States and obviously a deep partnership that we've had with Haiti for some time, um, but also that it really decapitated the uh, government, as well as, as I mentioned, the UN, MINUSTA was, we had a large UN um, uh, representation on the ground, a lot of international donor agencies. So as we were trying to respond to the crisis, we were all actually part of the crisis because we, we were incredibly worried about our own people. I mean, just even within, obviously, the US Embassy, we were trying to account for personnel and sadly we did lose uh, lose some staff and then obviously quickly moving to our American citizens who often get trapped in these countries and I, I can talk a little bit about that as well because I think that's relevant to what we've been seeing around the globe right now in the um, in the COVID-19 response and and our embassies again really helping Americans evacuate and to, to get home. Let's, let's go back to that. Marie, can you open up the screen so we're back on and take down the slides? Thanks. Um, Talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, if, when you think about an emergency on an airplane, you th they always tell you to put your mask on first before you're dealing with a child or wh whoever your 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 dependent is that you're flying with. That's sort of the situation you're talking about. Um, the embassy has to make sure the mission has to make sure people are accounted for. That's right. And, you know, unfortunately, I think um, because this was such a devastating earthquake um, and we were trying to respond as a not just a government as the USG, but really as a country. I mean, more people responded to the Haiti earthquake than watched the Super Bowl that year. So bringing you back to 2010, it was a major event that people really felt compelled to respond. But we had to take care of our people and our embassy on the ground, um, uh, you know, we, 
they were flooded. They were just flooded with people, frankly, coming in trying to help and not recognizing that uh, trying to come in to help while uh, while still things were very shaky there in the sense that people were sleeping in their offices. The embassy ground was flooded with tents um, because there was nowhere to stay. And so we unfortunately did have many groups once, and I can talk about it, it took us four days before the airport was able to be opened and before planes were able to go in. But once that happened, we, we talked about in the after action report that there was almost a disaster on top of the disaster. And that was because so many people were trying to help by sending goods uh, through a pipeline and also sending people when there really was not a support infrastructure there um, for our embassy uh, to really take care of them. And yet, as you know, we are responsible for all American citizens when they are abroad. So it was um, it was a tremendous um, you know burden, frankly, on the embassy who were just trying to account for not only the American staff, but of course the majority of our staff when we're overseas in the embassies, our local staff and making sure that they were okay um, and their families. And that was very difficult. So oftentimes when we think about these crises situations, it, it's a, we were talking about this last week, it's like running a marathon, but at a sprinter's pace. This can obviously take a very big toll psychologically, but also mentally. Uh, and I know for the teams back here, as well as on the ground, that was very much the case. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I think that sprinting a marathon is just a wonderful metaphor because when it happens, your adrenaline is going. As you could hear me tell the story, it brings you back and you're just, you're operating for days without sleep. You're forgetting to eat. You're just, you're, you're, you're really focused on saving lives. And, um, you know, Haiti was our largest search and rescue operation. We, um, we were able to rescue 136 people, um, meaning pulling them out of the rubble. We had, and they were US fire, uh, Fairfax County, LA County, you know, responding. And so you're running on that adrenaline. And the dogs. And the dogs, and the dogs. Uh, you know, they are so pivotal. Everyone loves these dogs, but they're just amazing because they can pull them out and you see people being pulled out of the rubble and it just, it just keeps you going, going. And then all of a sudden you do hit a wall, just like in a marathon. And, um, and you don't realize your body and your emotionally you're going through that. And there, there were moments, uh, you know, I know for all of us and, and when you're leading, I know this is so much about leadership and I, I saw amazing leadership skills at all levels uh, during this crisis. Um, but one of the most important things is to recognize when you're about to hit that wall because you got to keep going. You can't stop. It is not an option to just drop out of the marathon. <laughs> um, and so really being able to be in tune with where you're at and then and to call for those lifelines and the, that support to help get you through. I remember I was at an event you were supposed to chair about a week after this happened and suddenly Susan is gone and gone <laughs> for weeks. You know, just absolutely gone. And, you know, obviously there are lots of people who came in to, to give you support and, and their backstops and things like that, but, but that's so true. Um, before we go to some very specific critical lessons that you have on slides, what are some of the most striking memories that you have from that time? Yeah, um, boy, I, you know, I mentioned the search and rescue and, and obviously the incredible adrenaline you can get, but also the devastation. And, and one of the memories uh, really, uh, I think about it quite often actually, is um, a hotel apartment building called the Montana, where many of us stayed. I stayed in the early 90s for months uh, and we had a, an American student group there. Um, and unfortunately, um, the Hotel Montana collapsed. Hmm. And we were getting a lot of, and we'll talk about this, the fog of response. We were getting a lot of conflicting uh, information about who survived and who didn't. And um, you become all of a sudden very attached to certain stories, even though you're dealing mm -hmm. with a lot of different things. And there was something maybe perhaps because I had lived there and I could picture it um, and picturing these students. Um, and, and it was really... Um, one of my clearest memories was when we had thought one student survived and, and then realized she didn't and then having um, to call off the search and rescue. And I remember really, really vividly 
um, that decision being made and sitting in my boss's office and just starting to weep because when you call it off, you're just sort of giving up hope. And uh, that, that was really tough. And then being able to kind of keep on going through that. And I guess what kept me going was, you know, it was always the Haitian people and just the resilience and, and our people who were working on the ground, uh, just being able to hear their voices and see what they were doing every day. And then obviously when I was able to finally get um, into to Haiti again, um, that, the, that resilience and that hope, um, despite the heartbreak and the devastation, um, which again, I think all of us are experiencing right now as we yeah. see the reports, there are heartbreaking stories every day and then there are just amazing hopeful, hopeful stories. So we're gonna go to the slides in a second, but I wanna note that um, you're uh, an athlete and that you know, there are a lot of lessons learned in leadership from playing team sports. This is true. Um, <laughs> I'd say I'm a former athlete, <laughs> um, but yes, I think it does um, shape us, you know, whether you're into athletics or the arts or, um, uh, you know, different activities that I think shape us early in life and teach us life skills, something very much the International Youth Foundation focuses on. Um, but, it, you know, some of the skills clearly are around teamwork. I mean, yeah. most importantly, when you are operating in a disaster, the most important important skill um, is teamwork because it's not about you. It's about right. the team and keeping the team going. And it's, you know, the other thing I think is really clear and we see this a lot today is the importance of communication right. and communication skills. And I do think, you know, as we uh, develop and hone those skills in our youth, it, it really um, serves you later in life. And I, I was very appreciative to just sort of rely back on, on some of those uh, basic life skills that I think we learned whether through sports or the arts or other ways um, when we're young. Marie, do you want to pull up the slides? We've got some very interesting uh, slides that you've shared with, with lots of different groups about uh, specific lessons. I think it's the next slide. Yeah, okay. Well, and just to, um, I talked about some of the things that really stuck with me and here's the hopeful message. Um, it, it really was the Haitian people and, you know, seeing uh, them respond to this, not just crisis, but really the devastation that lasted for some time with rubble. These are um, Haitian uh, workers who basically obviously had, had lost quite a lot and uh, they volunteered, they were part of a public works program that we started in order to clear the rubble. And I just can't emphasize enough how much rubble there was um, to even just make Haiti um, and Port-au-Prince in particular operational. So some of the lessons, let's go to the slides. These are actually lessons um, that came out of an after action report that we did um, in June of 2010. So six months after the earthquake, uh, the entire interagency gathered, uh, the leadership, so about 200 people, and we spent a day, and we really said, what did we learn from this? Because this was a massive effort, and then how, what are we going to do differently, most importantly, moving forward? So um, what I'm going to go through really quickly are, you know, the, the fog of disaster, as I alluded to, like what does that mean, and the importance of data, and I think our data um, gathering and analysis has definitely gotten much better since 2010, but it's clearly relevant for today's uh, crisis. The logistics and how logistics are really um, pivotal. And again, I think we're seeing that with the testing today with uh, the global pandemic. Um, the importance of local capacity. Um, you know, again, so much of international crisis response had been about bringing from overseas to the local level. And that shifted with Haiti, I think, dramatically. And that's a very good thing. And again, we're seeing this with the pandemic, the importance of building local capacity to respond to the crisis. Um, interagency roles and responsibilities. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons from this, and I'll share that. And then um, the importance of exercising, um, if you will, or planning jointly. And you hear a lot of discussion today in relationship to the global pandemic. Um, did we game this out? Did we game out what a global pandemic would look like? And, and the reason you do that is so everybody works together and understands what the assets are. So let's, uh, let's then just go to the, the, the slide. next slide. 
Okay, so what we mean by the fog of disaster response, just as you have the fog of war, is that, and we really found this with Haiti, um, that we just didn't know how many people had been impacted. We heard so many pieces of conflicting data um, over particularly the first weeks. And a lot of um, what I'm going to talk about are the first really, I'd say, nine weeks or so. Um, so assessing the initial target group was incredibly hard because, as I mentioned, uh, we were not able to get teams onto the ground uh, really until Saturday. So imagine like the earthquake happens on Tuesday, we're trying to get in Wednesday, we're not getting in. Finally Thursday, the Coast Guard helps get some folks in over water, so very few people. And then Friday, we actually had to take over the airport. Um, as a matter of fact, the Haitian government asked us to take over the airport so that we could start getting people and relief supplies in. But we didn't have data, and so what this means is we were trying to assess, you know, obviously water was pivotal and um, and food and we were starting to see looting happening. You remember uh, there are a lot of images of you know the the stores and just looting happening across the board. People were getting desperate by particularly that Friday and Saturday, um, and so we were being told everything from you might need to send in 87 million MREs, meals ready to eat, or 2.7 million. And I really remember being in that meeting and saying there's a huge difference between 87 million and 2.7 million. You know how how many latrines did we really need in order for sanitation uh, purposes? 24,000 versus 7,000. So the need for data and clear data to make decisions, you also have to remember during this period, um, right after the earthquake, in addition to responding to the crisis, we were going over to the White House every day for three hour meetings. And we had to have data to present to the interagency to say, here's what we know. And we had a really tough time in the beginning because we just didn't have clear data. It was so can we, can we pause on that for one second? Because sure. I know that our former boss, Raj, would have been asking, asking, asking for good data, wanting to use innovation technology to, to capture it. But also, is this the moment to talk a little bit about the role of CNN, uh, Sean Penn, yeah. and others coming in? And you're in those meetings, and everybody's seen them on television saying various things, and they're helping to drive the conversation in these interagency meetings. Yes, um, it, it really um, it, it awakened me to the impact of the international media on policy at the highest level. We always know that the media has influence, but it was amazing to be in um, the Situation Room and to hear people quoting, well, I just saw that there were airdrops um, you know, that are being covered by CNN and um, how are we going to respond to that and moving, you know, resources into areas that were not necessarily the highest need re air, uh, resource areas had a tremendous impact. And then you have the celebrity effect, um, which can be a good thing. I mean, again, I want to applaud the celebrities who engage in these crises as we're going to see tomorrow. Uh, there's a big celebrity event to raise mm -hmm. resources and that's a positive thing. But you also can have a bit of um, the story moves to the celebrity and that can get a Again, draw the most um, the most resources, and in this case, um, Sean Penn. He really invested a tremendous amount in a camp, setting up a camp for the displaced, um, and so a lot of our resources went to that camp. Again. He did a tremendous amount to draw attention, and that is a positive thing, but trying to balance that out. And that was, I think, one of the first times, uh, at least that I saw at the highest policy levels, that really the celebrity uh, impact and the, and the um, international media impact. And, and you need to take that into a, an account as a leader to be prepared to answer those questions and how to balance it out. Yeah. Yes, you mentioned tomorrow night there is the Global Citizen Concert. This is the same organization that every year uh, at the end of high level week in New York City, at the end of the high level week of the UN General Assembly, they sponsor a big concert in Central Park around the sustainable development goals. And obviously we have COVID-19 hitting directly on the SDGs and sort of making clear the case for sustainable development. So that'll be at 8 p.m. tomorrow night on a variety of, of channels. Should we go to the next slide? Yeah, let's do that. And this really gets to the, the logistics um, and how important logistics are. And we're, again, we're seeing this right now with the global pandemic of really being able to get uh, testing out there is so critical. And in the case of the Haiti earthquake response, it was how do we actually um, get food, water, and really the, the most urgent 
uh, resources into the country. And so, you know, a couple of lessons learned here, and again, this comes out of our after action report, the importance of having these pre-existing agreements, that there are agreements, you know, in this case, it would, we really needed to look at um, agreements with the Department of Defense, who was incredibly responsive to the needs. Um, the comfort, for example, that you're seeing off the coast of New York City was something that we uh, utilized in the response for Haiti, as well as then um, commercial sources. We as well were using commercial aircraft and other means to get it in. But the most important lesson here is about having, in, in this case, local nonprofits and community organizations that are out there in front, they know the communities best, they know how to get the resources, they're partnering with the private sector. And so really that the government playing a supporting role and helping those local organizations lead the way. And I think again, um, that is something that's really pivotal. The um, finally on logistics is transparency. One of the things uh, with the response with Haiti, as I mentioned, you know, there was not only just the one airport uh, to get goods in, but it was really damaged. And so everybody was trying to clog the system. Again, it wasn't just the US, we had the entire international community responding. So we created a web-based system to actually show which goods were getting in from what country. And it was a little frustrating for the Americans because while we were controlling the web-based system and the airport, we actually waited till the last hours of every day to get our goods in because we had to show that we were committed to the international response, that it was not all about the US. And But having that transparency, again, I think the importance that we're finding now on data and every day looking at the data, understanding what is happening, how, how many people are actually entering the hospitals, respiratory, PPE, test kits, having that transparently shared is absolutely essential in a, in a crisis. Well, and this is what a lot of the information systems folks do. I mean, this is where their skills can be um, most helpful. Should we go to the next slide? And yes, again, this is, I think, the importance of um, really having the local ownership in responding to the crisis as opposed to those coming in from outside. You know, first of all, because it creates confidence in um, the community. And, um, but also they have, they know the fastest ways to actually reach community members um, that outsiders are never going to know. And so, you know, building local ownership and local capacity um, from day one it, is really critical. And again, this shows the connectivity between the national and the local and the international. And we're seeing it here. I mean, we're seeing yes. it absolutely all across the United States. Um, next slide, please. Hmm. Ah, th this, I think, is probably one of the most important lessons um, that we discussed after the Haiti earthquake, and I, I've actually talked about it in every single crisis I see. The first is having very clear guidance from the top. Um, it has to be, you know, President Obama on the first day uh, said we are going to have a robust integrated response and USAID as the lead humanitarian agency by um, really by executive order, and this goes back many, many administrations, is the lead for humanitarian response. And so that clear guidance um, was essential. And then just always being able to have um, the protocols and the processes in place in order for then the, in this case of Haiti, the whole interagency to, um, to connect to. Though there were gaps. I mean, there were absolutely, we had never had um, a, a, a disaster of this magnitude off the shores of the United States with that clear direction uh, that we were going to do everything possible to save lives and have an integrated response. And so that did, um, it, it highlighted the need to, and I think we're gonna talk about this in the next slide, about you know really being able to um, have roles and responsibilities exercised and planned out so that the relationships form, but you also have the protocols in place. But, but before we go to the next slide, two things, actually, can we just go back? There are two things. One is we are now having a conversation about what would it mean to have development experts, both domestic and international, at the table at cabinet level uh, this is one of the few times where, I mean, the head of USAID is not a cabinet member, but the president then taps Raj and AID to be the lead. I can imagine in a number of crises, including the one that we are experiencing now, 
if we have an elevated role of understanding sustainable development as part of the national security apparatus, that's going to have a big impact. Yes. But I wanted also to have you comment, while well, this occurred and the president was very clear, there's also the personal, right? And, and here we're talking about Secretary Clinton. The Clintons had honeymooned in, in Haiti. Uh, she deputizes her chief of staff, Cheryl Mills, to be point. Can you talk a little bit about that personal political nexus? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think you can never escape um, recognizing that even our highest policy leaders, um, they're, they're people, you know, and they have um, personal connections to issues that they work on and taking that into account in any environment you're in, whether you're in a crisis or just in a, a normal working environment, understanding the policy leadership. And in this case, um, obviously it was very personal for Secretary Clinton um, as well as her entire team to really make sure that we were responded to this. So while the president was clear, um, you know, the Secretary of State, who is also um, the, the head of not only foreign policy, but the administrator of USAID's boss. And so she was very clear the, of her engagement, um, not just from making sure that we did everything possible, but really at a personal level and, and really cared deeply. I, I remember sure. one time uh, leaving uh, principal's meeting and we had been in there for two or three hours um, and we were all coming out of the room and Secretary Clinton included and they had just pulled an elderly woman out of the rubble and um, and her her touching my hand saying look look amazing people are still being saved we're doing good and giving hope I mean I think really you know because you you do go through a lot of emotions when you're working on a, a crisis that is a marathon and so um, you know there was there was a real personal element in this um, not just you know for obviously the secretary but I think for many of us who you know worked in Haiti and, and really loved the country sure. before we move on let's translate this RMT on Oh, the sure. RRB's ninth floor. Yeah. Yeah. So um, USAID on the very top of the building has what we call a response management team. It's where everyone gathers when there is a crisis and you have 24 seven operations. People are, you know, basically on line and working on different issues and everybody has roles and responsibilities. And just like in any emergency, you know, you have shifts and people come in and replace you on that shift. And what happened with the Haiti earthquake response, because the president was so clear that we were in charge, I remember literally I think the second night, I believe it was, all of a sudden everybody you know, from across Washington was flooding the Ronald Reagan building and showing up, whether they were the Department of Transportation, Department of Health and Human Services, obviously DOD, and saying, we're here to help, the president said. So we would send them up to our RMT and it was just inadequate for that response. So we had to create lots of different um, spaces throughout, uh, throughout the agency in order to host the interagency in the response. One of my favorite moments of Madam Secretary is when she, I can't remember what was happening, but she calls out, she says, call USAID, let's stand up an RMT. <laughs> of course, nobody understood what was going on, but <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Okay, and this was essentially what I was pointing out, and, and this is the final slide really, about the importance of building the partnerships and exercising and planning jointly. Um, it is something that has gotten better over the years, um, but you know, as we're seeing today in the global pandemic response, while there were certain exercises, if you will, to respond to a global pandemic, I think there's been a lot in the news about how there just wasn't enough. And so roles and responsibilities then are not only unclear, but you, you also don't have the partnerships and the relationships. You don't have the pre-existing agreements, as I mentioned. Um, and it was incredibly confusing in Haiti because we had not done enough of that, particularly with partner organization, NGOs, the UN, the UN had just started a system called the cluster system, um, and there had not been enough of- So aptly named. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that was a real, that was a real problem um, in the response. You know, it's hard, I think, a lot of times, and I, I think as a student, I didn't quite understand the importance of the planning and the exercise. Um, and of course, you had just spent a year at NDU before you came in as the acting assistant administrator for DACHA. And 
obviously DOD is excellent at planning. Um, they are. And so I think that one of the, we're gonna do a hot wash on what happened with COVID-19, we hope when we're able to gather. Uh, and we'll be looking in part at a CSIS report that was issued in the fall about how we're not ready uh, and the need for more, for more planning and exercises. Um, as you know, Heinz uh, does do planning exercises and we do them actually with the military over a long weekend. Um, but I think that there is, we could do even more probably. So do you wanna go back to um, the screen with you and me? Sure. Sorry, if you can. So I guess the question I have right now is in emergencies and, and I think literally for Haiti, there are oftentimes you hear about build back better that you know there's this need or desire impulse right after the emergency to build back better and then over time it recedes and i'm wondering do you think in this case i mean is the thing that we're going to take away from covid19 that we got to commit to this this is a once in a generational opportunity uh to, to do this or or are we going to go back to sort of business as usual hmm. Well, I do think a global pandemic is different in, in compared to other crises in, in the sense that this is affecting all of us. And when I, I talk to people who are on the front lines of the uh, of whether USAID or in the humanitarian relief effort, I think the difference is, is that all of us are being affected by this. And yet, as you said, Sarah, I mean, there's always going to be this, well, we're gonna have reinvent education systems. We're gonna reinvent uh, livelihoods are gonna look different. We knew there were problems with the gig economy. This only highlights it even more. Um, and so I do think that there's always hopefulness and, and opportunity. I guess why I'm more uh, optimistic this time that the world really will look differently than it did before um, is because it, this is so unprecedented. This is like no other crisis I think any of us uh, have ever seen. And as a result, you know, I do think that um, we will be able to do things differently. Um, but I think, you know, our concern and the build back better always comes from, uh, you know, obviously uh, the resources are flooding in and there's just this energy and you recognize what can be differently. Um, but one of the real perils uh, that I've seen over the years that prevents uh, countries uh, from really building back better, if you will, is governance. Uh, and this is obviously near and dear uh, to your heart and your expertise that if you have um, fragile states and if you have weak governance um, within countries, that is such a huge impediment to the longer term building back better. And I do worry about that greatly um, with, with, as we think about the resilience and the recovery phase um, that the weak, the weaker governance systems and the more fragile states um, will not be able to do so. I mean, they, they, and you've seen in the reports, I'm sure, you know, just looking at Africa, they could have 300,000 deaths. Um, you know, that this is going to be absolutely devastating if we do not invest in many of these countries. Um, that said, I think in the more um, developed and emerging economies, I think there's a real uh, hope to uh, build back better in the sense of certain areas and, and livelihoods and education systems and even um, engagement. I think it, we were seeing unprecedented levels of uh, civil society engagement, many of them youth led, um, creating disruption clearly between youth state relations. But I think now we have an opportunity to harness that energy of civil society engagement in order to create really um, some, some movement in the world that, that we've all seen um, is possible. And we're seeing it in climate, right? Look at the climate sure. and how it's changing without our footprint. Right. I will say I heard, uh, I was on a call yesterday for USJLC, uh, US Global Leadership Council and Dr. Dybal, who is a uh, mentee of, of uh, Dr. Fauci was talking about actually in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, there's huge community health practice. They have much better muscle memory, if you will, on contact tracing. And, mm -hmm. and so there's certain elements of yeah. the health on the on the ground, the health system on the ground that we actually don't have. Um, but yes, everybody's 
very nervous and, and obviously the, the governance issue is, is critical. I'm worried about corruption uh, in a lot of places. I'm worried about, you know, where does the money go? You can't, it's hard to build back better if you don't have the resources, but I do think it's a big opportunity to address inequities across a lot of different communities. Um, before we turn to how IYF is, is handling this, I just wanted you to comment on, it's very clear to us that different communities experience crisis in different ways. We're seeing this just in this town. Uh, we're seeing it in your state, you're in Virginia, I'm in, in DC. Um, but we, you must have seen that on the ground in, in Haiti, um, that it's not an even playing field for everybody. Uh, there's some that are really, really devastated. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the heartbreak in Haiti was going into um, some of the you know, poorest areas. There's a, a neighborhood called uh, City Soleil, which is always, I mean, I had known it for, you know, 25 years at that point. And it, it was the, I'll never forget walking through there and just seeing it post-earthquake. And it was, it was just horrific. Um, and, you know, other communities that obviously were much better off before the earthquake did much better coming right. out of um, the recovery. And we're, gonna, we're seeing that, as you said, right now. So let's turn to how your colleagues and IYF are handling this. As you said, there is this opportunity for youth voice and youth empowerment. This is going to be something that affects generations the way I think the depression affected my grandmother, um, maybe your grandmother. I mean, this will have an imprint. Uh, what are you hearing from your colleagues around the world? You've got offices in, in, in Mexico, in Jordan, um, I, I think in parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have um, 10 offices around the world as well as um, our home office in Baltimore. And, and so the good news is everybody's safe and uh, everybody's working virtually. We made the decision five weeks ago, as a matter of fact, uh, globally to really go to work from home. And uh, so we were one of the early adopters. And um, fortunately, because of the way we work virtually, um, it's been seamless and people have been able to really stay together and, and keep uh, working. Working. The challenge is, uh, you know, from country to country, every country is responding to this differently. Right. And, um, and so that has uh, really created a lot of challenges for our teams. Our teams are all locally led on the ground, all of our offices, and we work only with all of our local partners. Um, and so you have some countries like Tanzania, where it's business as usual, according to the government. Um, and then you have others like South Africa and even Zimbabwe that have responded in much more, um, in a much different way. So it, it has created uh, challenges. Um, but, you know, getting back to your point about what we've seen is the innovation. I mean, it's just amazing how creative uh, people are when they are confronted with all of a sudden having to work at home, but you're really trying to respond to the crisis and um, and uh, be be having an impact. And so our, our network is millions of young people across the globe. IYF has existed, as you can see, for 30 years. It's our 30th anniversary. And uh, so we have different networks that we've tapped into over the last month in particular and what we've seen whether it's through our youth action network alumni council which is uh, leaders at uh, youth leaders around the world who told us um, and are really activating their networks to supply PPE um, you know one of our youth leaders ran an innovative social enterprise around shoes um, and he's pivoted that to uh, resourcing PPE and that PPE actually ended up going to Oregon. Um, so that's just one concrete example. They're doing, you know, uh, 3D creation of uh, respirators. They're designing different therapies. So the energy and the innovation and the creativity of the youth networks, I, I get to see and hear on an every, er, every single day. And that is inspiring because like you said, Sarah, I think this generation um, is shaped in the way that um, I, I look at the greatest generation is truly the greatest generation. And I think this generation we have now uh, responding to this crisis is um, really going to not only match that, but exceed that. And thank goodness, because, and that's why we need to put them in the driver's seat. Um, and 
I think that is the challenge we have before us now is often in leadership, we don't think about those um, youth leaders and innovators as, as someone who should actually be making decisions and driving uh, driving change. And we, we need to do that because uh, not only have they demonstrated that, but they, um, they, they have solutions. And so we're trying to work on really the larger systems change um, in order for them to be not only at the table, but really leading the discussion. So you have this even closer to home. You have two university students that are home. One is a graduating senior. How, how have they handled this? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, remarkably, uh, you know, both of them, and particularly a college senior, for those of you who are graduating soon from your programs, I mean, that's hard. It's it's having your entire, you know, spring last time together, you know, just wiped out. And um, but what's amazed me about her, and as well as our son, who's a freshman, is their resilience. They just you know, once the shock, I think, wore off within probably uh, just a couple days, uh, they just dove in and, and now are moving forward. And, and just, again, I think that resiliency that you see in the younger generation, I've been able to see uh, here at home and not just with my kids, but so many young people I, I talk to. And so, you know, I think the other thing that really helps um, is that they're connected and they're connected in a way, obviously, virtually every day with each other and they're solving problems and the creation Creativity. And, and so that is what makes this generation different, I think, than other generations facing crisis is that this sense of connectivity and that we will get through this together. They're empowered, they're connected, uh, and happily, if they're at Carnegie Mellon University or, or Heinz, they're getting even more skills. And I also want to thank you for your many years of uh, engaging, teaching Heinz and DC students. Um, it's it. invaluable for our students to be able to uh, interact with, with folks who have experience in the real world, in policy making, um, and particularly in, in international development, sustainable development. So Susan, thank you so much for joining us today. And everybody give her a round of applause. Um, <laughs> next you. week, we'll have our third in the series. We'll be joined by uh, our former colleague, Wade Warren, who was uh, a lead for USAID responding to the Ebola crisis and is now uh, at Deloitte where he's he's working on COVID-19. Um, so I hope you'll join us. That's next Thursday at 1215. Thank you all so much. Be safe. Thank stay you. home. Stay Take healthy. care. <laughs> okay. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.